Let's solve it. Two beads of mass M are hanging from the ceiling by non-conducting strings. Why do you think I said non-conducting? What would happen if I actually connected them by a wire? What's the difference between a conductor and non-conductor? Yes? The charges may move over the conductor. So we are now sure that the charges in these small uh, beads stay there. They are not going anywhere. OK? Good. Strings of length L, the beads carry equal charges Q. And in equilibrium, the angle between the ropes is pi over 3. That's in radians. In degrees, what does that mean? It's 60 degrees. So can you tell me what's the distance between? Okay. That's right. It's also L. Okay. Now, what are the forces on <coughs> acting on one of the beads here? So if I take a, one of those beads, Q, can you tell me what are the forces on that? There is mg downward. That's going to be the gravity. That's due to the gravity. And then there is the electrical force. Let me call it Fe right now. And there must be some tension in this rope so that this, these two things do not fly away. What's the angle between vertical and t? Pi over 6. It's half the angle here. Now, this thing is in equilibrium, right? So forces in each direction must cancel each other. I know that mg must be t times cosine pi over 6. Cancellation of forces in the vertical direction. And Fe must be t times sine pi over 6. In other words, I can write this as, <coughs> let me divide these two equations. Fe divided by mg is tangent pi over 6. But what's Fe now? 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q squared divided by the distance between the two charges is L, so it must be L squared must be mg tangent pi over 6. Let's remember the numerical value for that. It's sine pi over 6, what's, which is 1 half divided by cosine square root of 2. So this is 1 over square root of 3. So q squared is 4 pi epsilon 0 l squared mg times 1 over square root of 3. q is 4 pi epsilon 0. Now let me write it like this. mg over square root of 3. Square root times Now, whenever I solve a question, I'd like to do three checks. First, did I reach my goal? What was asked in the problem? We were asked to find Q. But finding Q in terms of only the given quantities, L, M, G, and universal constants. Did we do that? Yes, only L, M, G, and epsilon 0, which is a universal constant, appear in the answer. So we have reached our goal. The second thing I want to do with every question I solve is to check the units of this problem. OK? Now, what are the units here? Do you remember the unit 
for epsilon zero. Now I don't. Okay. So every time I write f is equal to one over four pi epsilon zero q square over r square. So epsilon zero units is coulomb square per newton meter square. Okay. So let's check. So this is coulomb square per newton meter square. What's the unit of m times g? It's a force. It's newton. Right? So the unit of epsilon 0 m g is coulomb square per meter square. The unit for square root of epsilon 0 m g times L is, this is coulomb per meter, this is meter, this is coulomb, q is coulomb. So unit wise, we've actually done this correctly. Now, you may think this is a stupid thing to do. I'm losing time. And why would you think that? Because you're all coming from the university entrance examination, almost all of you, where you're programmed to answer questions within a minute. Most of our first year students, freshman students, try to answer questions within a minute. If the answer is taking more than one minute to find, there's a biological clock inside that goes off. There is panic, you know, sweating, all kinds of terrible things happening. But no, what we're trying to do now <coughs> is try to answer one question per almost 20 minutes or half hour. So you can save three minutes for a unit check. The unit check is extremely important. It will tell you if you made a mistake, okay? Nine out of the 10 cases you will see if you have made a mistake by taking a unit check. Now there's a third check I like, that is looking at some of the limits of the physical limits of the problem, where it's easy to solve the problem and see if my answer makes sense. What would be the distance between these two charges? If L or if Q was zero, what would be the distance between these two charges? It would be zero, right? They would just touch each other. Q goes to zero means L should go to zero. That's the distance between the charges. Does it? Yes, we take the limit to find the side limit. If these are very heavy charges, very heavy beads, I have to put more and more charge so that they are separated by 60 degrees. So if mg goes to infinity, q should go to infinity. Do I check that limit? Yes, if mg goes to infinity, q goes to infinity. So we have found our goal, we have reached our goal. It's in correct units and it fits two limits nicely. Most probably we've solved this correctly. All right? I'm going to repeat this procedure again and again. Now, let's talk about something new. All the stuff I've done up till now, more or less you've covered in high school, I'd expect. But now let's do something new. Let's talk about not discrete charges, just point charges everywhere. But what happens if I have a continuous distribution of charges? If I have a Let's say if I take a whole plane and put charges everywhere, or if I take a sphere and fill it with charges, what does the electric field look like in these cases? So let me talk about charge distributions. Now, the simplest way I can actually take a continuous charge distribution is maybe take a region, a rod, you know, take my pen and put some charges onto it and distribute them evenly onto this pen. Okay? So if I have a rod of length L and if I put 
a total charge Q onto it. If Q is uniformly distributed, on the rod of length L, what is the charge per unit length of the system? It's going to be Q divided by L. Such one-dimensional charge distributions are generally shown by the letter, Greek letter lambda. Okay, So this is the 1D distribution, 1D charge density. What's the unit for lambda? Coulomb per meter. You can think about doing this also in two dimensions. Maybe take one of these sheets, you know, put a lot of charges on it, and see what the electric field at some point is like. So if I put a total charge Q onto an area A, that would be a 2D charge density and that will be shown generally by the Greek letter sigma Q divided by A and the unit for that will be Coulomb per meter square. You can think about Doing this in three dimensions, maybe take some shape of volume V and put a charge Q uniformly into this volume. This is going to give you a 3D charge density, which is generally shown by the Greek letter rho. It's going to be Q over volume. And the unit for Rho will be coulombs per meter cube. All right. So we'll look at all three situations, but let's start with the simplest case. Okay. Let's see We have a ring of radius R charged with total charge Q find the electric field. On the axis, that's passing through the center of the ring. So, let me try to, let me attempt a three-dimensional drawing. So I have this x, y, and z coordinates. I'll get a ring. Which color should I get? get a pink ring. OK. of radius r. It's in the xy plane. And what I'm wondering is, what is the electric field at some point on the axis z? So the electric field at this point. Hmm. Now the charge is uniformly distributed on this ring. Let's start with a simpler question. What is the charge density 
on the ring. Okay, so in the electromagnetism questions, all out, all through this term, the first thing you need to do right is to think about the geometry correctly. Every time you see a problem, the first question you should ask yourself is, do I understand the geometry? Here, what's the geometry? I have a ring. I'm putting it onto the xy axis. What am I wondering? I'm wondering what's the electric field on the axis of the ring. If I, I'm at this point, which way is the electric field pointing? What's its magnitude? Okay? Good. So, we've understood the geometry. Let's now try to understand the distribution of charges. What is the one-dimensional charge density on the ring? Q. Q divided by the total length of the ring. What's the total length of the ring if the radiuses are? 2 pi r. Excellent. But now, the electric field. How do I find the electric field? Now, if somehow I did not ask you this question, but I ask you another question. Instead of a continuous distribution, if I said there were four charges placed on four points on the ring, how would you calculate the electric field? You would find the individual electric fields for all these objects and do a vector addition, right? That's what you would do. What would happen if I asked you, there are not four charges, but say eight charges? What would you do? You would once again calculate the electric field of each charge. How about not eight, but 16 point charges? I hope you see where I'm going with this, right? I'm going towards calculus. I'm going towards integration. Conceptually, it's not too different. If I had point charges, I would just keep finding the electric field created by each point charge and adding them up. Now that I have a continuous distribution, I have to do this for infinitely many small points on this ring. All right. Now, as you can see, I'm terrible with uh, three-dimensional drawing. So what I'll do is, I'll draw a top view of this. And the side view. Now the top view, if I'm looking at the system from the top, I just have a nice ring. And if I'm looking at the system from the side, so this is x-axis, this is y-axis. Now this is z-axis, and this may be any one of the other axes. I'll see my ring as just <coughs> two points at r and r. Right. Now I'll do the following. <coughs> Let me take a small section of this ring. Let's say this angle is theta, and the small angle here is d theta. Can you tell me how much charge is there on this small section? What is dq? Now, if I know the length of this section, if I know the length of any section of this circle, I can immediately multiply it by lambda and know how much charge there is, right? So this dq must be lambda times whatever is the length of this small section is. Now, what is the length of this small section, dl? The radius is r, the angle it sees is d theta, so dl is 
R times d theta. OK, I, I'm bothered a little bit. So now tell me, if I have a circle, if the angle here is theta, the radius is r, what's the arc length here? Arc length is r times theta, if theta is expressed in radians, not degrees. If it's in radians, r times theta tells me the arc length. Does it work? For 2 pi, it works. 2 pi times r is the total circumference of the radius. So what's, once again, what's the length of this small section? The angle it sees is d theta. So the length of that section is r times d theta. How much charge is there in this small section? Lambda times dl, which is lambda times r times d theta. OK? Good. Now, what I'll do is, now that I've calculated the uh, charge there, so I'm looking at the same system from the side, I know what kind of electric field, so this is my dq, I know what kind of electric field it will create here. It will create an electric field like this. Right? This is going to be Z, and this is going to be R. Now, if I add up all the small sections around my circle, which way will the total electric field point? Yeah, which way? Along the z-axis. Why? Because of symmetry. That's the right way to think about it. Now, if I have an electric field created by this dq, and if I integrate, if I go around all my circle, I will surely go to the opposite side. The charge on the opposite side will create another electric field, right? Small electric field. So opposing sides will create two electric fields. The x or y components will cancel each other. These two components will cancel each other. But z components will strengthen each other. They will survive. So I can immediately say that E is parallel to Z by symmetry. All right? There is another way to talk about this symmetry. OK, think of the ring as the top of my can. OK? Now, is there a preferred direction on this ring? Is one direction different from the other? No. So when I create an electric field on the axis, can it choose one of the directions? No, it cannot. All the directions are the same. So the only way the electric field can point is along the z axis. So you could have just as well given the same argument here. Good. E is parallel to z by symmetry. That's great. Now. Then I can just write EZ, the Z component of the electric field. And I'm going to need this figure, so let me clean it up a little bit. Let me call this angle alpha. This angle is going to be alpha. Can you tell me what's the z component of the electric field here? Well, if it was just the magnitude of the electric field, I would say it's 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. The charge is dq. The distance from dq to my observation point is z square plus r square. That's the square. 
But that's just the magnitude of the vector. What do I need to do? I need to write cosine alpha there. So let me repeat. D E Z is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 d q divided by z square plus r square. But cosine alpha, if the angle here is alpha, the angle in the lower triangle is also alpha. So cosine alpha is what? z divided by square root of z square plus r square, right? Is everyone agreeing with me? Good. So this is going to be z divided by square root of z square plus r square. Hey, I've already calculated what dq is. So I can write d e z is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. <coughs> Let me write all of these together. And dq is lambda times r times d theta. What did I find? What's this object dEz? dEz is the electric field, the z component of the electric field, created by this small section. To find the full electric field, what do I need to do? I need to go over the whole circle and add all of these easy contributions. So the full electric field, which will be in the z direction, I already know, is going to be integral dEz, which is going to be integral z 4 pi epsilon 0, z squared plus r squared to the 3 halves, lambda times r times d theta, and right now, this integral doesn't mean anything because I need to actually tell you the limits of the integral, right? Where would I start integrating from? Well, okay, I'll choose to integrate from angle theta equals to zero. And I'll go all through the circle. I'll go to theta equals 2 pi. So my integration limits must go from 0 to 2 pi. All right? Did I cover all small pieces? Yes, I did. Oh, okay. So that looks like a horrible integral, doesn't it? A lot of factors in there. But does r, what's r? It's the radius of my ring. Does it change with theta? No. Does z change with theta? No. Epsilon 0 is a universal constant. Lambda is a universal. Well, lambda is another constant we have found. It depends on q. So everything inside the integral is actually a constant. So it turns out it's the simplest integral in the world. What's the integral from 0 to 2 pi d theta? What's the integral Integral dx? It's x, right? So this is going to be theta at 0 and 2 pi, which is going to be equal to just 2 pi. So apparently, the electric field on the axis is z divided by 4 pi epsilon 0, z square plus r square to the 3 halves. Now, times lambda times r times 2 pi. But what was lambda? I defined lambda myself. Lambda was not given in the problem. <coughs> lambda is q over 2 pi r. So this is actually q. All right. So the electric field is 
q over 4 pi epsilon 0 z divided by z square plus r square to the 3 halves. Let's do a quick check. Did I reach my goal? Yes, I was given Q, I was given R, I was given also the universal constant epsilon zero, and I was asked to find how electric field changes with Z. So I reached my goal. How about units? Now, very simply, electric field for a point charge was Q over epsilon zero, well, unit wise, times R square. Yeah. So the unit Q over epsilon zero is already here. Whatever left must have units of one over meter square, right? So what's the unit of Z divided by Z square plus R square to the three halves? This is meter divided by meter square to the three halves. So this is one over meter square. So the units also check. But what is more important is the limits. What is the electric field exactly at zero point? If I'm at the center of my ring, what would be the electric field I see? It should be zero. Why? Because electric fields from all sides are cancelling each other. So let's check. At z equals to zero, Ez is zero. So that limit checks. But here is a better limit. What if I go very, very far away from this object? Maybe think of this object like a hydrogen atom. Its radius is one angstrom, and I'm looking at it from one meter away. So what happens if R is much larger than, I'm sorry, just the opposite, R is much, much smaller compared to Z. Then here is my electric field. Let's see, Q over 4 pi epsilon 0. Z, now R is much, large, uh, much smaller compared to Z, so I'm going to ignore that. So this is going to be Q over 4 pi epsilon 0 z square. <coughs> so if I'm actually very, very far away from this ring, it should look like a point charge of total charge Q. Does it look like a point charge? Yes. I cannot see whether it's distributed like a ring or a sphere or whatever it is. I just see the total charge on it. So this looks like a point charge as it should. Okay. If I am very far away, I will not be able to see the radius. Now, let me quickly do one more example, right? And next time we'll start our lecture with a quiz again on Wednesday. Okay, so let me solve one more example. Let's say that I have a rod of length L with total charge Q. First, find what's lambda. That's the easy question. Now, the second part is so this is point P and this is D. What is the electric field? at point P, which is a distance D away from my end point. All right? Let's quickly solve the first part. What's lambda? It's the definition of lambda, Q over L. That's great. But now how do I solve the other part? 
Here is how I solve the other part. So I have a, the distance d. Let me put my origin of coordinates here. So this is x equals to 0. This is x equals to L. Now, if I had small point charges on a line, what would you do to find the electric field? You would find the electric field by each point charge and add them up. So what should I do now? I should take small sections of this, of width dx, which is a distance x away. What is the charge in the small section? Lambda times dx. What is the electric field created by this small section at the observation point? Let me call it dE. It will create a field dE. 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 dQ divided by what's the distance? d plus l minus x, right? That's what I see. The distance here is l minus x. Although my small section doesn't look too small, so maybe it's actually better to draw it smaller. Okay. d plus l minus x squared. So 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 lambda times dx divided by d plus l minus x squared. What's the total electric field? It's integral dE. So it's going to be integral lambda over 4 pi epsilon 0 d plus l minus x squared dx. But now I must write the limits correctly. Where do I start integrating from? I start integrating from 0 and I go all the way to l. So this goes from 0 to l. Let's do the integral. It's not too hard. Lambda is a constant, I take it out. 4 pi epsilon 0 is a constant, I take it out. From 0 to L, 1 over d plus L minus x squared dx. How do I evaluate this integral? Piece of cake, I'll just change my variables. Let me call y as d plus L minus x dy would be minus dx. When I do a change of variables, I must make sure I change the limits of my integration. If x is equal to l, y is d, right? If x is equal to 0, y is d plus l. So let's rewrite in this coordinates in the y coordinate, 4 pi epsilon 0, lower limit is d plus l, upper limit is d, 1 over y squared, I have minus dy, or lambda over 4 pi epsilon 0, d to d plus l, 1 over y squared dy. When I have a minus in front of the integral, I can flip the limits, right? What's the integral? Come on! y to the n dy integral is y to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. When n is equal to minus 2, this is lambda over 4 pi epsilon 0, y to the minus 1 divided by minus 1 at d plus l and l. So this is going to be lambda over 4 pi 
epsilon 0 1 over <coughs> L minus 1 over L plus D 1 over D, thank you What was lambda? It was Q over L. So the electric field magnitude is Q over 4 pi epsilon 0 L 1 over D minus 1 over L plus D. Very quickly, did I find, did I reach my goal? Yes, Q and L were given, D was given. I found the electric field. But not really. Why? Because I was asked to find the electric field. And I did not specify the direction because it was so simple. But if I have a cruel instructor who likes taking off points, he would take off points for this. I would maybe say, if this is x hat, electric field at that point is E x hat by geometry. Okay, now I also told you what the direction is. Good. So I reached my goal. How about the units? Again, Q over epsilon 0 is right. I must multiply it with 1 over meter square 1 over L times 1 over D minus 1 over L plus D Units is 1 over meter square. So that checks. How about the limits? What do I expect? Limits, especially when D goes to infinity, what happens? When I'm very far away, I should see just a point charge. And let me do it quickly, and maybe I'll explain it the next time. Q over 4 pi epsilon 0, L, 1 over D. And if D is much larger than L, then I can write this as 1 over D, 1 over 1 plus L over D, which I can approximate as Q over 4 pi epsilon 0, L, 1 over d minus 1 over d times 1 minus l over d. I'm again making an approximation. 1 over 1 plus epsilon to the power 1 is 1 minus epsilon. So what do I get? Q over 4 pi epsilon 0 d square for large d, which is like a point charge. So which is what I expected in the first place. That's all for today. See you in two days.